So welcome. Uh, this session is uh, on um, Sunday homily and Catholic social mission. And my name is Ian Mitchell, and I'm a staff member of the Office of Education and Outreach in the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the Catholic Conference of Bishops. So uh, we sometimes get lost in all of our titles of departments, but it's a department that's been doing good work there uh, at um, the Bishops' Conference for a number of years. I'm sure a lot of you have been involved with it or touched by our work at times. And we'll share a little bit uh, of the work that, um, that we're doing at USCCB and at JPHD today. But primarily I want to focus on the statement that we're reflecting on, the um, preaching the mystery of faith, and on its relationship with our social mission. And uh, so that's what we'll be talking about. I'd like to start just with a brief word of prayer, if we could. So I just ask that uh, everyone take a moment to be peaceful and in the present moment and realize that we are in God's presence. And this is a reading from the prophet Isaiah. This rather is the fasting that I wish, releasing those bound unjustly, untying the thongs of the yoke, setting free the oppressed, breaking every yoke, sharing your bread with the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your own. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your wounds shall quickly be healed. Your vindication shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove from your midst oppression, false accusation, and malicious speech, if you bestow your bread on the hungry and satisfy the afflicted, then light shall rise for you in the darkness, and the gloom shall become for you like midday. Then the Lord will guide you always and give you plenty, even on the parched land. He will renew your strength, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring whose water never fails. The ancient ruins shall be rebuilt for your sake, and the foundations from ages past you shall raise up. Repairer of the breach, they shall call you restorer of ruined homesteads. And so, Father, we ask you to bless us in this time of sharing today. Ask you to open our hearts, our minds, to the power of your word to transform us and our world. We ask you to bless this conference. We may be ever more ready to respond. Amen. So thank you all again uh, for being here. And uh, that's, a, I think, a powerful passage from Isaiah. Uh, it's quite a mission. And I think when we talk about something like a new evangelization, uh, a movement into greater life uh, as a people of faith and in the world, uh, that vision is, is uh, deeply encouraging. Uh, at the same time, it challenges us and points out directions we need to, to move in. So I, I hope you'll appreciate the relevance to our topic today. And just to give you some sense of an overview of what uh, I'd like to spend time on today, I uh, would like to tell you just a little bit about our work in Justice, Peace, and Human Development. We won't spend too long on that. Definitely want to speak about the context which we're, um, which we're in, uh, seeking to foster social mission of our church today. Um, definitely the topics of the new evangelization uh, and what Pope, Benedict is, Pope Francis excuse me, is sharing. Uh, are critical, you know, both, both popes, frankly. Uh, the continuity is one of the key issues uh, that, that, uh, that we try and focus on. Uh, and we believe this, this continuity goes far back, uh, certainly as far uh, as the Second Vatican Council and the Communities of Salt and Light statement, which we'll spend some time with today as well. So that was a statement from 1993 from the U.S. bishops. And we feel that, that the call in that is still very, very relevant and it's something we're going to be focusing on in our, in our office in months and years to come. Uh, and uh, then to focus on this statement, preaching the mystery of faith itself, and draw out the elements that are, that are um, consonant with social ministry and also encourage us to, uh, to understand that a, a lived expression of our faith is critical for preaching to reach its, its fulfillment. 
Uh, and uh, finally, then we'll just have some time for questions and answers together, so or reflection. I think most of the answers are out there in all of you, so uh, hopefully draw a few of those out. So, um, by way of introduction, I thought it would be helpful just to uh, share a little story. Again, I'm at the Bishop's Conference today, but I, um, I've been blessed to find my way largely in response to the sacraments, to good preaching, uh, to people who are engaged in really grounded ministry uh, that, that um, has its home in the church but moves out beyond the walls of the church. Uh, I did that as a lay person in my 20s. Uh, in my 30s, I moved into religious life and I spent about six or seven years in the Society of Jesus and the Jesuits. Had wonderful formation there. Uh, and now I continue to sort of follow the call uh, as I continue to, to listen to it um, in, in work of lay ministry. But a few years ago when I was at Loyola Chicago, uh, I was at Mass uh, at the University Chapel and uh, was sitting in a, in a back row as Catholics are sometimes known to do. And I uh, noticed sitting next to me there was a young woman uh, and afterwards got speaking with her. It turned out she was from China uh, and fairly recently arrived in this country and was a recent convert. And as we stepped outside and walked along Lake Michigan, uh, she asked me a really kind of piercing question. She said, have you ever experienced any miracles? And not something that we ask each other that often as Catholics. Uh, it took me by surprise and I thought about it for a moment. Um, was pleased to say yes, that uh, I knew at least one was coming to mind in that moment. Uh, that I, you know, I had been a person like her who really embraced my faith as an adult uh, and sitting in pews in a parish in Washington, D.C., had heard the gospel pronounced uh, in the context of um, a lot of people who struggled in life, mainly in India. So these were missionaries who were preaching, uh, who had spent long, many years in India. Uh, amongst people at the margins of society. And uh, when they preached, uh, there was power in, in that grounded message that, that uh, was learning as much as it was teaching the people around them, learning from them. And I had, f I had been more and more inspired. I had eventually left my job. Uh, I had gone to India to do some volunteer work. Found myself at the Damien Social Welfare Center uh, in northeast India in the state of Jamshedpur. Uh, this is a center that helps people who uh, have been um, ill with leprosy. Most of them are cured, but they have terrible disabilities uh, due to the disease, and their families suffer a lot of stigmatization and, and, and uh, in many ways are outcasts. So visited the center. A Jesuit took me down to uh, visit some of the people who live there permanently. They call the VIPs. Uh, and I asked him on the way, I said, is there anything I should worry about? And he said, well, you know, there's a very slight chance you might contract leprosy. <laughs> so he, he managed to get me nervous. Uh, and, uh, of course, I had, I had, it didn't last. I'd already heard that's very difficult. You have to have a long time of exposure. So, uh, but it played into my fears just the new, of the newness of what I was going to experience. Um, I went down and met these people, and they so quickly came up to embrace me, uh, to shake hands, uh, to give me a hug. And it was just the contrast between my fearfulness uh, and their openness. Uh, and um, it had an immediate effect on me. You know, it, it, it made me more open. And, uh, and they asked me, do you know Father Lacey? Do you know Father Hunt? Uh, and these were priests who I had been listening to um, in the pews in Washington, who I'd been hearing pronounce the gospel. So it really left me with a sense of the miraculous, you know, that, that, that we're touched uh, by the Spirit in one location, and it can send us on tremendous journeys. Journeys into parts of our cities that we don't know, uh, journeys into areas of the world that we don't know, uh, people who are new to us, and yet who somehow speak a word of God to us as well, by their actions or, uh, or their words. Um, so that was what I shared with this young woman uh, by Lake Michigan, uh, one miracle that I've experienced. And I think that is a power that, that, that the Word has for us, uh, that the sacraments have for us, that like a, like a pebble in a pond, it sends out ripples in our lives that change us and change us together as community, not just individually. It's easy for us to get drawn into personal transformation. That's central. But in the end, it's going to be communal transformation together. So uh, I think that kind of an experience happens for lots of us. 
Um, it's what draws many of us into ministry, and I would say in my department at, at the Bishop's Conference in JPHD, uh, that's the motivation that we, that we, uh, that spurs our ministry and our work, uh, even though it's very administrative a lot of the time. Uh, and it's what is calling us to respond to the needs of today. So a little word um, about that power, again, in, uh, in people's lives. Uh, this is a, a man I met on the journey. Uh, but it's the words of a philosopher who says, to sanctify God's name, as the Lord's Prayer asks us to do, is to learn to hear events as so many of God's words. It's through such listening that the history of all flowing moments unfolds a holy history, far from being confined to the past. Each person in truth becomes himself only through listening to such a radically other voice, which always comes as a disruption, reaches him by means of events, always renews itself, and therefore calls me to renew myself through a renewed effort of attention. And that's the uh, French philosopher and Catholic priest, Jean-Louis Chrétien, speaking about the radicalness of calling and how it transforms us and surprises us. So I hope that we'll hear some of that through, uh, even through what we share today. At Justice, Peace, and Human Development, we have four offices that are trying to hear the call and respond and encourage others to respond. Uh, the Office of Domestic Social Development uh, works primarily on domestic policy. Uh, a heavy emphasis is on uh, alleviation of poverty and protecting people uh, who are in poverty. They've been very involved with the um, circle of protection. Uh, in fact, really the originators of the circle of protection and working with a broad coalition that continues that effort. The Office of International Justice and Peace um, works on a broad range of, uh, of international issues. Um, again, food, hunger, poverty are major issues of concern, but war and peace more explicitly. Uh, and many, many issues we realize cross between the, the areas. So things like uh, prevention of violence and uh, um, you know, the issue of guns, which we've been hearing about in this country recently, is, is often a cross-border phenomenon. So international justice and peace is very involved in. Uh, prevention of violence. Um, Catholic Campaign for Human Development uh, is grassroots community development, working with directly with people in poverty, helping them uh, be empowered and find their own solutions. Uh, and it continues its very good work. And then the fourth office, many people don't know about, but is education and outreach. That's where I work. Uh, and we're trying to, in many ways, communicate the work that those other three very specialized areas are doing. Um, and connect it with the lives of people in dioceses, in parishes, in religious communities, on college campuses, through media, um, print media, electronic media. So um, trying to be as mobile and responsive as we can to, uh, to the needs of the moment. And we'll have a chance to speak a little bit more about, um, about what that work is. But again, just to draw, draw out that this is, this is mission and ministry. Uh, we are in this work trying to respond to the call that God gives us throughout the scriptures and that we hear on Sundays. You know, who do you say that I am? Uh, from Luke, we heard Sunday, right? Jesus directly asking us. And we believe this work is, is part of, of how we respond. Um, in Isaiah, God asking, you know, who am I to send? Who will go for us? Uh, the church continues to respond to this call. And I, uh, I think when people in parishes sometimes feel, you know, what's the church doing? What, what are they saying? It's our responsibility to try and let them know this is work that we're doing and that we'd like them to join. Okay. So, uh, the language of faith is critical to this work of education. Uh, a lot of the work is highly specialized in Washington. Uh, policy work can, you know, has its own uh, kind of patterns and, and rhythm and language. But for the public, especially for people in the pews, it's, it's critical that we're speaking in the language of faith mm -hmm. so that people understand and we're helping them make the link between the word they're hearing, the sacrament they're receiving, and what happens when they step out of the church doors in their families, in their communities. So these are a couple of resources we've developed recently. Uh, Sacraments and Social Mission makes this link very explicit. Uh, and uh, there's, there's a, a section for each of the sacraments and then how it relates to um, our life outside the church, uh, the walls of the church, as it were. Uh, Two Feet of Love in Action is, uh, is an old resource that's been updated. Uh, so 
this sense of two feet of I wondered, I wondered yes. Had it ever been updated? So. Right. So it's it's still with us, and uh, the emphasis both on uh, works of, um, of of charity, as it were, direct, immediate service, works of mercy it used to be called, uh, and uh, works of social justice, addressing the kind of systemic issues that cause poverty and injustice. So um, uh, we've tried to incorporate in Two Feet of Love and Action uh, much of the teaching of Pope Benedict uh, and um, again his emphasis on love as the foundation. Uh, so, uh, so that's a great resource and it, there are materials available for education with young people. Um, uh, particularly, and we're, we're rolling out more training materials around that. So I have copies of those for you today. Good. So uh, again, this is all to say that we're about an evangelization. We're using this term, the new evangelization. Uh, but we are responding to a call of the Lord, and we're hoping to invite more people uh, on this journey. So, uh, um, uh, again, you know, the sense of a witness, that we have to live a witness to our faith is critical. And I think that's what you hear uh, in the documents around the new evangelization. Uh, there's, there's not one place we can go for that, but, um, but we have tried to draw out some of the resources and we're sharing a few of those here. One is the um, Pope Benedict's letter, uh, his apostolic letter of Porta Fide, the door of faith. Uh, and he says, we make it our prayer that believers' witness of life may grow in credibility to rediscover the content of faith that is professed, celebrated, lived, and prayed, and to reflect on the act of faith is a task that every believer must make his own. Okay, so again, the call is to all of us, not just some of us, and that's a theme we'll be hearing uh, as we go along. Um, what the world is in particular need of today is the credible witness of people enlightened in mind and heart by the word of the Lord and capable of opening the hearts and minds of many to the desire of God, to the desire for God and for true life, life without end. So again, credible witness. Key, I think, in what's going to attract people who maybe you're feeling a little dry or cold in their faith, to, uh, to engage. And people who feel distant from their faith to tune in again is, I think, seeing that credible witness that what we say, what we preach, is actually flowing out in the way we live. And this is coming from the heart of the church. Finally, a new evangelization is synonymous with mission, requiring the capacity to set out anew, go beyond boundaries, and broaden horizons. The new evangelization is the opposite of self-sufficiency, a withdrawal into oneself. A status quo mentality and an idea that pastoral programs are simply to proceed as they did in the past. So that is not from Pope Benedict directly, but it is from the outline, from the bishops, uh, international bishops outline for their synod. We're still waiting for the final document of that synod. I understand it may even be coming later this year. But their outline going into it was bold and it really said we can't continue uh, in a limited way or just as we have in the past. Uh, we have to be more open and willing to, to step out. Uh, it's a call we'll hear again from Pope Francis in a minute. Um, uh, and I think yesterday we talked about this, the formation of clergy and the tendency at times for people to want secure identity. And that's a key moment in, in development. It's a key moment in faith uh, development. But if that's the end, if that's where people stop, then uh, we can really end up in a, in a difficult position uh, in relation to the outside world. And, and the church is calling us to, to be in relationship. Uh, Pope Francis, as I say, continues this, this general theme. He says, in this time of crisis, we can't just worry about ourselves, can't get wrapped up in loneliness or discouragement. Please do not get locked away in yourselves. When the church becomes closed up in itself, it gets sick. The church must go out from herself. Where? Towards the boundaries of existence. Faith is an encounter with Jesus, and we must do the same as Jesus. Meet others. We have to bring about encounter. We must go out to meet the poor. Today, imagine all the children who don't have something to eat is not news. It's serious. We cannot stay calm. We cannot become starch-pressed Christians, those Christians who are too highly educated and speak of theological issues over tea, calmly. No, we must become courageous Christians and go out in search of those who are the flesh of Christ. 
powerful words, passionate words. That last line is, is uh, particularly stirring. Go out in search of those who are the flesh of Christ. Um, uh, that, that, that shakes us up, I think, and it breaks open some of our categories. Uh, and uh, so we are hearing this call in the, in the tradition of the church, in the recent past of the church, and very much uh, in the present. Um, one of the places that the call came through very clearly was in the U.S. Bishop's document from 1993, Communities of Salt and Light. And uh, this statement was really addressed to parishes. It, uh, something you, some of you may have seen, uh, this is a copy, it, it's subtitled Reflections on the Social Mission of the Parish. So it is really designed uh, um, uh, for people in the pews uh, to, uh, to engage in this mission and to support and encourage them. Uh, so uh, a key topic is that social ministry is integral to faith and to parish life, not something that's only one element. It, it's integral to the whole, uh, the whole thing. Uh, it says, we cannot proclaim a gospel we do not live, and we cannot carry out a real social ministry without knowing the Lord. So it goes in both directions, right? We can't preach and not practice. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we can't practice if we haven't been experiencing the sacraments and, and being open to the word of God. And hearing his call to justice and peace, parish communities must show by their deed of love, deeds of love and justice that the gospel they proclaim is fulfilled in their actions. It brings occasional controversy and conflict, but it also brings life and vitality to the people of God. It is a sign of our faithfulness to the gospel. And uh, in the same document and on the same theme, we continue, we need to build local communities of faith where our social teaching is central, not fringe, where social ministry is integral, not optional, where it is the work of every believer, not just the mission of a few committed people and committees. Worship that does not reflect the Lord's call to conversion, service, and justice can become pious ritual and empty of the gospel. Again, uh, stirring, uh, shocking even, that um, just how, how critical this movement from uh, worship into witness is, uh, and, and really not, this indicates it's not even a sequential, uh, you know, we can't hold one separate from the other. Uh, they really have to be drawn together. So it influences the formation of clergy and the formation of those who will preach. It certainly influences the way people are preparing homilies as well as uh, presenting them, and the way they indicate options for people when they step out the doors of the church the ways the community is going to act uh, in, in the broader society. Um, again, we're going to, sorry for the heavy text, uh, I know it can get a little dense, but I'll try and draw out just the main points. Again from Salt and Light, integration is the theme, but particularly through preaching here. So it says, Eucharist, penance, confirmation, and other sacraments have essential social dimensions that ought to be appropriately reflected in how we celebrate, preach, and pray. Those who plan to preside at our worship can help the parish community understand more clearly the spiritual and scriptural roots of our pursuit of justice without distorting or imposing on the liturgy. Excellent. Excellent. So saying we, we shouldn't hold back from, from these topics, even though we know they can be difficult. Um, and it's to find that delicate balance, which takes training and wisdom. Preaching that reflects the social dimension of the gospel is indispensable. Priests should not and need not impose an agenda on the liturgy to preach about justice. Rather, we urge those who preach not to ignore the regular opportunities provided by the liturgy to connect our faith and our everyday lives, mm -hmm. to share biblical values on justice and peace. Week after week, day after day, the lectionary calls the community to reflect on the scriptural message of justice and peace. The pulpit is not a partisan rostrum, and to try to make it one would be a mistake. But preaching that ignores the social dimension of our faith does not truly reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Again, I think a challenge that, that, that I'm sure many of you will have seen, uh, particularly having gone through a political season not long ago, there is often a tendency to, to drag people into the political discourse uh, in a very direct way. And this is cautioning us about that. Uh, but it is saying the... Uh, it's not politics itself that's a problem. It's not engagement with society. It's partisanship, right? So um, that's, priests I know are struggling with that. We are hearing in some... Bishops are struggling with that. Bishops are struggling with that, yes. And we're hearing in, 
uh, you know, in, in research that we're doing that priests uh, often, and bishops, you know, they, they feel uh, the criticism of the faithful, of people in the pews, and they're very sensitive to that. And it is causing priests at times to withdraw from this, this element in their preaching. So a certain sense that if we just stick to scripture, if we just stick to our prayer life, then um, sort of the rest will take care of itself. And to do that ignores much of the teaching of the church, much of the kind of engagement um, of who we are as Catholics. So um, how to do it is a more difficult matter, how to do it sensitively and responsibly. Uh, and I, I believe a key element is formation. Again, that will be throughout this presentation, but um, ongoing formation with people at the margins of society that, that um, opens our hearts and uh, um, in some ways gives us a location for the gospel. So. And to do one more uh, set of quotes that I think just sums this up from Salt and Light, um, really about renewal, that this is key if our parishes are going to be alive. Uh, and if, if we are going to be successful in a new evangelization. The parish is the place we should regularly hear the call to conversion and find help in answering the Lord's call to express our faith in concrete acts of charity and justice. We see the parish dimension of social ministry not as an added burden, but as a part of what keeps a parish alive and makes it truly Catholic. Effective social ministry helps the parish not only do more, but be more of a reflection of the gospel, more of a worshiping and evangelizing people, more of a faithful community. It is an essential part of parish life. Um, the call couldn't be much stronger there, you know, that, that um, we have to be in touch um, with those outside uh, in order for our parishes to really come to life. Okay, so I hope that that is... Uh, it's clear that uh, this is a, we're, we're building on something when we come to documents like the preaching uh, of the mystery of faith, and, and I think you'll, you'll find there is continuity. Uh, it's a statement, preaching the mystery of faith is a statement that is informed by our social teaching, and it calls us to live out the social teaching of the church. And that's why I, um, I often will use these terms social ministry or social mission. Uh, the, the tradition of Catholic social teaching is rich and wonderful. But if it remains uh, sort of rarefied as an abstract thing, uh, if it sits on the shelf, it's really not fulfilling its purpose. Uh, it has to be um, integrated in our lives and it has to be carried out in our society. So um, preaching the mystery of faith uh, represents that, reflects that. Bear with me with a few more quotes. <laughs> These are rich and I think critical to, um, to understanding the possibilities for this document uh, in training of clergy and preachers um, and for the public. Okay. So the preaching the mystery of faith, the statement indicates that the homily which prepares, which participates in the power of Christ's word ought to inspire a sense of mission for those who hear it. Making them doers and proclaimers of the same word in the world. A homily that does not lead to mission is therefore incomplete, all right? And I, I sensed that sometimes yesterday in our discussion that um, uh, we would come to the edge of that place and then we'd back up to talk about our internal life. Uh, but it's very clear if the homily and preaching isn't projecting us out in some way into our families, into our cities, uh, into the world, then that homily is incomplete. Uh, the topic of conversion is critical. And these second two quotes, um, speak about this ever deeper conversion that good preaching, good homilies can, can uh, assist us in and, and really work in us. Uh, what conversion of heart and mind will be necessary to bring the message of the word to action in our lives and those of others? It is that movement from prayerful attentiveness to the word, to reflection on its meaning, and to proclamation of the message in speech and action that undergirds the preaching ministry itself and provides the logic of this statement. So it's really foundational to, to what the statement uh, um, on preaching is aiming at. Since the kingdom of God is at hand, the only proper response is a radical change of heart. Repent and believe in the gospel. The Greek word that lies behind repent here is metanoia, or metanoiate, 
which literally means a change of mind or a change of perspective. Jesus invites his first hearers to turn from sin, to change their attitude, their entire manner of living, and to now see reality in the light of the gospel, the good news of God. This is why every effective homily is a summons to conversion. The announcement of the kingdom through the words and examples of the homily, if it is clear and compelling, inevitably leads the hearer to a desire to be changed. All right. How many of you would say that, that you're, you see that regularly around you in the pews? Uh, that, that, that fire to be changed is, is, is breaking out in the people sitting next to you. Um, I think we have seen it. I have experienced it. Um, but what we're hearing from people is that they're not finding that enough. That they're, they're feeling we, um, perhaps in a, in a world with a lot of change, in a society with um, a lot of transition, People are feeling a need to be more defended, more cautious. And even our relation of, of God's word uh, has become more cautious in many, in many situations. I mean, I'm you know, experiencing it myself, right? Yes. And so, so I remember quite clearly a few years ago my pastor saying, talking about a retreat experience. He said, you all really ought to make this retreat. It really will transform your life. And I'm saying, saying to myself, I'm pretty comfortable where I am. I really don't want to be transformed. That's right. You know, so... Um, you know, I don't think any of us are immune to it. Exactly, and that's key. It's, it's human nature, and we see it all through the Gospels, right? We see it in the disciples, and mm -hmm. um, their own blindness at times, their own resistance. Um, so that's, that's a wonderful point. Thank you, Clark. It's, 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 uh, um, it's something we will face, and if we can be prepared for it, uh, we, we can also uh, strive to be open to newness. Um, but we're in the midst of that dynamic as church, uh, and in, in responding to the teaching that we've been hearing since Jesus himself in terms of how we should be living together with others. So uh, encount we are encountering Christ, just as the disciples did. Uh, we're encountering Christ ourselves in the Eucharist and in the Word. So we're bound to have some of the similar uh, inspiration and struggles that they did. From preaching the mystery of faith, uh, again, uh, the story of Emmaus, the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, and their own disbelief, their own um, grief, and, and what happens to them. It is then that they admit to one another, after encountering Jesus, that their hearts had been burning within them as Jesus opened the meaning of the scriptures for them. The Emmaus account illuminates the interpretation of the two dimensions of the Eucharistic liturgy. Jesus' explanation of the scriptures, the liturgy of the word, leads to an intense experience of communion with the risen Christ, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And the very vividness of the latter brings about a deeper appreciation of the former. Were not our hearts burning within us? One of the most important teachings of Vatican II in regard to preaching is the insistence that the homily is an integral part of the Eucharist itself. As part of the entire liturgical act, the homily is meant to set hearts on fire with praise and thanksgiving. So again, this is what we hope for. This is what we um, are hopefully training our clergy and our preachers for, um, is for a powerful encounter with the Lord uh, and to be open to transmit something of that encounter in their preaching, uh, so that people are uh, having the experience of their own hearts uh, burning with love for the Lord and, and for God's people. Therefore, a wedge should not be driven between the proper content and style of the Sunday homily and the che teaching of the church's doctrine. To encounter the living presence of the risen Christ in the word of the scriptures and in the sacrament of his body and blood is not incompatible with effective communication of what faith in Christ means for our lives. Without being pedantic, overly abstract, or theoretical, the homilist can effectively spell out, for example, the connection between Jesus' care for the poor and the church's social teaching and concern for the common good, or Jesus' pronouncements on the prohibition of divorce and the church's te teachings on the sacredness of the marriage bond or Jesus' confrontations with his opponent and opponents and the church's obligation to challenge contemporary culture about the values that should define our public life. So it seems that what the statement's aiming at here is a, is a, a kind of a synthesis. Uh, it's saying that um, 
you know, as we've talked about liturgical style of preaching in this conference, that we can have a deeply liturgical perspective and at the same time be expressing the relationship to the tradition in the church, the teaching of the church. In this case, we're particularly concerned with our social teaching, our social tradition, uh, and with what's happening in people's lives and in, in the world. Uh, to do that without stepping into the partisan realm, to do it with a certain gentleness, uh, um, perhaps that you know, calls us to examine our own weaknesses, our own limitations more than is demanding that we uh, take a particular line. Uh, that, that questioning and reflection can be very helpful in bringing us to new understandings and new commitment. The, uh, um, another important topic that is raised here is the uh, um, appropriate incorporation of this doctrine in catechesis. So we've, the, the statement and what we're going to hear about later today is that uh, doctrine in catechesis has a place in preaching. But I don't think we have to fear that what's being recommended is that we return to that being the primary mode of preaching. Uh, it's saying that it, it has a place, uh, but it is with, with uh, strong qualifications. And I wanted to uh, draw one of those out here. So um, the statement says, so when all is said and done, why should the homilist preach doctrinally and catechetically? Because as Paul the Evangelist knew, the people are drawn to Jesus and his gospel by the beauty and truth of the mysteries of our faith. The ultimate goal of proclaiming the gospel is to lead people into a loving and intimate relationship with the Lord, relationship that forms the character of their persons and guides them in living out their faith. A good homilist, for example, is able to articulate the mystery of the incarnation, that eternal Son of God became to dwell among us as man, in such a manner that his listeners were able to understand more deeply the beauty and truth of this mystery and see its connection in, uh, with daily life. I'll skip ahead a little bit. The key po point here is, by expanding the congregation's love for the humanity of Jesus, the homilist could also move his fellow Christians to a deeper sense of justice, with a sense of compassion for the most vulnerable and the poor and the broken humanity of their neighbors. Okay, so it's making these links that um, in some ways, take, they take a skill and, and subtlety in communication. They also take a deep, grounded experience with people that can't come quickly, and it's not superficial. Uh, it has to be developed in people. Those of you who are in seminary training, I, you're in the midst of that. And, and it's a long process of, of introducing people to others, other perspectives, other experiences. Uh, it's what I've been privileged in my own ministry training to experience. And, is how we hear this deep calling and give it, give it context in the world. So, uh, as we've heard over and over, the field is the world, uh, as we talked about yesterday from Matthew. Uh, it's not just within the walls of our church. So, uh, it's appropriate uh, that our doctrine and uh, um, catechesis can move us to that extension into the world, um, if handled delicately. Experience, as I'm, as I'm mentioning here, is also critical. The experience of preachers, the experience of the community. Being an effective storyteller may not be a gift that comes easily to everyone who must preach, but the lesson here is that the homily must have empathy for human experience. Observe it closely and sympathetically and incorporate it into his preaching. The role of reflection on experience was a particular emphasis of fulfilled in your hearing. Mm -hmm. And here the, the statement, Preaching the Mystery of Faith, um, quotes directly from the earlier document. In order to make such connections between the lives of the people and the gospel, the preacher will have to be a listener before he is a speaker. Listening is not an isolated movement. It is a way of life. It means openness to, to the Lord's voice, not only in the scriptures, but in the events of our daily lives and in the experience of our brothers and sisters. All right, so, so a withdrawn perspective is not going to be helpful in this context. Uh, rather, someone who's, who's listening, who's open, uh, who's willing to hear new ideas, new experience, and, and be changed. And that's a foundational attitude for a good preacher, as we hear. Uh, let's see. So a further point uh, here is that the goal of the homily is to lead the hearer to a deeper inner connection between God's word and the actual circumstances of everyday life. In some instances, one's own experience, told in an appropriate way without drawing too much attention to oneself, can also be effective. Um, 
skipping ahead just a little, uh, consequently those who've been changed with preaching by virtue of a specific ministry ought to take this task to heart. Generic and abstract homilies which obscure the directness of God's word should be avoided, as well as useless digressions which risk drawing greater attention to the preacher than to the heart of the gospel message. So staying focused is critical, uh, but um, finding that place of balance um, between uh, the sharing of experience and the transmission of the word as we, as we hear it. Yeah, my experience is that generic and abstract is just the kind of the default mode of preaching today. Mm. Um, and, and pietism, you know, which goes along with that. I just, it's, yeah. I just you know, hear it too much as I travel. Right. Visit a church on a Sunday. And, right. Yeah, and that, that doesn't reach people in the pews, mm -hmm. perhaps, and doesn't nourish us in the way we, we need to be nourished. Um, and yet it is understandable in some ways, we, as we were hearing yesterday, the cultural forces at work, the, mm -hmm. um, the generational transitions mm -hmm. uh, often lead younger preachers, younger clergy, uh, into uh, um, uh, primary emphasis on, on rootedness, groundedness, identity, uh, which again isn't wrong, uh, but if we get stuck there, then we're... Uh, uh, my own experience is it, is, it has no relationship to uh, the age of the preacher, priest and deacon. Ah, okay. So that it, it may be just a, a sort of movement that people fall into. Yeah, it's, it's, it's comfortable, it's easy, it doesn't require a whole lot of reflection on yeah. either social mission or, or on uh, personal experience, in, in this personal experience in the sense in which you yeah. were talking about it. Right. Well, um, we'll continue with these. I think that's helpful because the key thing here is that preaching stretches us. It stretches the preacher and it stretches the hearers. So I think uh, that, that's reflected here. Yeah, all the, 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 the examples that preachers tend to give are, are what I would think of as canned. Yes. They're canned examples. Right. You know, right. Parents and children. And, you know, those kinds of right, right, right. So the breadth of experience maybe is too narrow. Yeah. Um, um, just continuing to take the lead from the statement here, and Pope Francis, who is certainly breaking us out of any sense of comfortable complacency, uh, from the statement, in the sense, the evangel evangelizer must also make sure that his own life has engaged the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Quoting St. Augustine, the Pope observes, he is undoubtedly barren who preaches outwardly the word of God without hearing it inwardly. It takes a deep spiritual life and experience of the world. We need to go out then in order to experience our own anointing. Its power, this is from Pope Francis, its power and its redemptive efficacy. To the outskirts where there is suffering, bloodshed, blindness that longs for sight, and prisoners in thrall to many evil masters. A priest who seldom goes out of himself misses out on the best of our people, on what can stir the depths of his priestly heart. This is precisely the reason why some priests grow dissatisfied become sad priests, lose heart, and become in some sense collectors of antiques or novelties, instead of being shepherds in the midst of their flock, fishers of men." So I think Pope Francis responds to us well there. Um, by moving out, by stretching our own, um, our own uh, exposure to life and to the world, uh, we, we deepen our capacity to hear God's word. Um, as, as people in the pews, as preachers. Um, it's part of our spiritual life. It's part of our prayer life. These things are integrated. Uh, and we keep being called to that over and over again. So um, a bottom line is that preaching needs to be incarnational. We hear that message strongly through preaching the mystery of faith. Uh, to, to move us uh, to an appreciation of, of the incarnation of God's word. Uh, not partisan. Right? Not shallow in the way it, it, it asks us to apply it, but enfleshed. And a final reflection on the statement itself. Uh, it would be inappropriate for the homilist to impose on the congregation his own partisan views about current issues. Yet for preaching to be so abstract that it reveals no awareness of or concern for the great economic and social issues that are affecting people's lives in a serious way, would give the impression that the words of Scripture and the action of the Eucharist are without relevance for our everyday experience and our human hopes and dreams. 
So you can see where the disconnect can happen if, if preaching uh, isn't, isn't uh, offered by people who've been formed well, who are prepared well, and who are in touch with the lives of people in the pews, people in their community. Uh, historical criticism reminds us that biblical religion, unlike mythic si systems, is rooted in real events and persons, and that God has, has deigned to reveal himself in the realities and particular circumstances of human history. Okay. So the relationship in the statement to social mission, I think, is strong. For anyone who's heard the call of of uh, communities in salt and light, I think you'll find that, that the same call uh, of our church uh, is reflected here in, in preaching the mystery of faith. Um, it leads us then to how will we, how will we put this into action? Uh, how will we um, respond to the document to, to adapt uh, formation of clergy, uh, to um, prepare people who are preaching, and to make sure the people in the pews are encouraged and supported in responding. And that's partly our job in, in places like Justice, Peace, and Human Development and many of the Catholic partner organizations to give people approachable ways, reasonable ways that they can respond. So um, I thought it would be helpful just to recap here on the scope of the relationship between preaching and social mission. Good preachers are formed in light of our social teaching and the mission in relationship with people in poverty and in hardship. It's part of formation. Good homilies are, are to be prepared with consciousness of our social mission. And parishes will thrive when members are open to transformation in response to the word and good preaching and are encouraged to engage our social mission. It, it's directly related to living, active, energized faith communities. Um, so it's a critical point and it's very timely that we're addressing this now. In the preparation itself, just to show the continuity with Fulfilled in Your Hearing, uh, th these were guidelines that were presented for um, preparing homilies, not for giving them, but for preparing them. Uh, and I think you'll see, um, reading the passage, sharing the words, uh, exegesis, exegeting the texts, um, all of those are, f are fundamental, basic, sharing the good news. But five and six are where, are where what we're emphasizing here is most relevant. Share the challenge these words offer us and explore the consequences of the word that we're hearing in our world. And obviously giving thanks and praise, uh, again, is, is foundational. Um, but uh, this is where we need to be encouraging our preachers to, to be open to, um, to the experience of the people in the pews, people around them, uh, and how this word affects them, what, what it calls them to in their lives in a, in a broad way not in a narrow way. Okay, so those three points I think are critical to kind of come away with. And I think we have time. I, I thought I'd just briefly share uh, this video, which is from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. And this Monsignor Pope from the Archdiocese of Washington, he's speaking about how we, how we move from the word into social, social ministry. Uh, in the community and how it gives life to his community. So I'll, I'll let him speak for himself uh, if we're able to play this. And I may, oh, I may have to step away to get it to do that. Let's see here. Let's see if we can get it to play. Excuse me. No, oh, that's not going to help. Oh goodness, well, it may not work. Okay, well we won't worry about Monsignor Pope. Uh, I will return to, uh, to the slideshow if I can. Ah, okay, thank you. Did you see from, second, second from the right, all right, from thank the you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm sorry we can't watch that now. Uh, it is available uh, with, uh, on our CCHD website at usccb.org. 
But uh, he's very helpful, I think, in giving, giving a sense of, um, of what it means to actually uh, live this in parish life. Uh, he uses the, particularly the, uh, um, the approach of community development, community organizing, uh, as, a, as a relational practice that helps him meet people in the city, meet people in his community, hear their needs, hear their concerns. Uh, and so the gospel has a, uh, comes to life in relation to those. So I encourage you to look at that on usccb.org. Um, just to conclude, again, what we're talking about is uh, that the world may be fashioned anew according to God's design and reach its fulfillment. So social ministry really is part of the transforming work of, of our faith. Um, it's integral. God created us without us, St. Augustine says, but he did not will to save us without us. So the involvement of people, the transformation of our lives, to, uh, to have the word affect us like a, like a stone in a pond, rippling outwards, changing the world, uh, is critical, and it's part of our faith. In the Gospel, we read how John the Baptist's followers came to Jesus and asked, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus responds this way, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. So those will be signs that our parishes are alive, that our preaching is reaching its destination. If we find really dramatic transformation happening in the life of a parish, more people being attracted and drawn, and if we find the parish is having a positive influence on the community around it. Okay. And a quote from uh, Pope John Paul II from his apostolic letter for the year of the Eucharist. Can we not make this year of the Eucharist an occasion for diocesis and parish, communi diocesan and parish communities to commit themselves in a particular way to responding with fraternal solicitude to one of the many forms of poverty present in our world? I think, for example, of the tragedy of hunger which plagues hundreds of millions of human beings, the disease which affect, afflicts developing countries, the loneliness of the elderly, the hardships faced by the unemployed, the struggles of immigrants. These are evils which are present, albeit to a different degree, even in areas of immense wealth. We cannot delude ourselves. By our mutual love, and in particular by our concern for those in need, we will be recognized as true followers of Christ. This will be the criterion by which the authenticity of our Eucharistic celebrations is judged. Okay, so uh, perhaps Pope Francis uh, is following in a strong tradition here of, uh, of stirring statements. The criterion of the authenticity of our Eucharistic celebrations is in how this experience of sacrament and word flows in witness. And without it, I think we have real questions about how we're proceeding. Uh, so, uh, now I'm skipping ahead just a little here. Let's see, did we have one more? Ah, yes, we had one more here. So this is why the, uh, the homily participates in the power of Christ's word. It ought to inspire a sense of mission for those who hear it, making them doers and proclaimers of the same word. A homily which does not lead to mission, therefore, is incomplete. I think that's clear. It's echoed through the current statement as we see, preaching the mystery of faith. So this is where we find ourselves, right? In a world that is broken in many respects, uh, and yet is filled with tremendous life, tremendous richness, the gift that is born into this world with each new child. And um, being open to being touched by that gift, the newness of creation in each person. Uh, and where we find suffering, where we find people aren't able to to fulfill their human dignity, their human potential, uh, to try and work for change uh, in those circumstances. And the church has done this all throughout its history. We follow Jesus in doing this. We follow the apostles in doing this. Um, where we run into trouble sometimes is where we, uh, we forget who we are as Christians and we get drawn into um, movements that aren't, that aren't rooted in the spirit, you know, that, that uh, are, are um, maybe at times overly political and uh, you know, and we, we're encouraged to go there as Catholics, not to stay away, but just to remember who we are, 
So that should encourage people, I think, who are concerned about the, the interaction of our faith life and, and life in the public realm. Benedict reminds us, love of God and love of neighbor have become one. In the least of the brethren, we find Jesus himself. And in Jesus, we find God. So our calling to social mission is that um, important. It's that uh, foundational. We really are looking to see the face of Jesus in our brothers and sisters. Um, to hear God's calling to us of who we are called to be. Uh, and to be energized to respond. And preaching of the word is, is critical to that. So I hope that's been helpful in, in understanding a little bit about how this document uh, may be calling to us uh, and how we, how we uh, may be called to respond in the moment. And I'd like to open up for questions and uh, see what further conversation we can have. So thank you very much.